What is the name of the Father? This is a really key term, particularly in Lacan's teaching in the 1950s. It persists through much of his work, even though in later years it becomes pluralized and we have reference to the names of the Father. Nevertheless, it's an absolutely vital term, particularly if we're going to take up where we left off when we were speaking about foreclosure and thinking about psychosis. So in this series of mini lectures, we're going to ask a bunch of questions. We're going to explore this concept. We're going to link it both to clinical imperatives, clinical structure, and also we're going to think about it in terms of Freud's earlier work and what it may mean in terms of Lacan's notion of the symbolic. So to start us off, a couple of questions. Why do we always have to make reference to the seal of the president? So whenever the United States president goes somewhere and he takes to a podium, you know, you've got this, this insignia, this emblem. You could ask a similar question, slightly different, now thinking about kings. Why is there the divine right of kings? Surely if I'm born, I'm the young prince, imagine that. If I'm the young middle-aged prince, whatever. If I'm the prince and it's clear everybody could see the king's my father, then I'm the king. Why do I need to make recourse to something symbolic outside that domain and say, well, there's this divine right of kings which confers upon me a certain authority? We could also say here, why the fascination with what might be the name of God? We're thinking here, and in fact, Lacan makes reference to this in several places, this idea that in uh, certain religious uh, domains, the name of God shouldn't be mentioned, or God is, in the biblical instance, uh, cited as saying something, I am who I am, I am he who is, something like this. Lacan makes reference to this kind of tautological avoidance of the name of God in some respects. Or thinking of things in a slightly more, uh, in the domain of Catholicism, why do we make reference to in the name of the Father? Why don't we just say for the Father? Why in the name? So in each of those three instances, it seems to me that we have this idea, and in many ways, this is the kind of germ, the, the, the little underlying question and insight within much of this theory, that a father in and of itself or himself or herself, interestingly, to presume for the father function to work, it needn't necessarily only be a man, biologically man, whatever. Why is it that for paternity to work, for the office of fatherhood, if we could put it that way, for the institution of the father or the leader or the king, some fatherly such roles, there seems to necessarily be some recourse to a symbolic element, some kind of authorizing function which is beyond the remit of that person and their intersubjective relations themselves. This is one of the key questions that will drive us in these, uh, in these several lectures. Sorry, father's authority is obviously failing here somewhere. So, <clears throat> last question. Have you ever heard this in popular culture? Who's your daddy? I have asked over beers, over meals with many colleagues, could you describe to me, I'm not sure I get it, when someone says, who's your daddy? What does it mean? People come up with various different kinds of interpretations. I don't know. I would be curious to hear from you what you think who's your daddy means. But to me, at least, who's your daddy is a kind of a put down. It implies that there's someone more senior to you, maybe someone to whom you have your allegiance. And it's perhaps also suggesting that who you are, your identity, what you mean, your value is only really sustained by a reference to whoever your daddy might be. What I also like about this, who's your daddy, let's just keep it floating there, we can keep on trying to generate questions and insights, is that you can't really answer it. Who is your daddy? Well, you know, maybe we've got some suggestions of who one's daddy is, but that doesn't seem to exhaust the question. There seems to be more to be said. Okay, so that's our little preamble. We've asked a bunch of questions. We've started thinking about various things. We've given this assertion that it seems that within the world of Lacanian psychoanalysis, there needs to be some kind of symbolic thing, some kind of symbolic operation that's occurring, which makes daddyhood, daddy-o, fathers, patriarchy even, possible. Now that we've done that, let's do our scholarly work 
We're going to look at two key reference points in, in Jacques Lacan's work. Uh, we're going to make reference to this fantastically well-thumbed uh, uh, translation, Bruce Fink's full translation of Lacan's Decree. And Bruce gets another starring mention because we'll also be looking at his interpretation. That's a slip, not interpretation, his translation of On the Names of the Father. Okay, so let's start off then with a reference from the version of the subject. Okay, here's Lacan speaking about the Oedipus complex. He says, uh, speaking of the Freudian Oedipus myth, the myth does not confine itself to the working puppet of sexual rivalry. It would be better to read it in what Freud requires us to contemplate using his coordinates, for they boil down to the question with which he himself began. What is a father? Okay, so, you know, I'm not like on. He says, what is a father? I say, who's your daddy? But whatever. Okay. Um... It is the dead father, Freud replies, but no one hears him. Lacan takes it up again under the heading of the name of the father. I can make all sorts of jokes here that Lacan calls himself in the first person. Lacan takes it up again under the heading of the name of the father. But let's just make several comments about that. Number one, Lacan is suggesting that the way the whole notion of the Oedipus complex has been taken up and understood and deployed within much of the psychoanalysis of his time, he thinks is problematic. When we say that, I think it's useful emphasizing that despite that Lacan and Lacanians say we're doing this fatal return to Freud, which incidentally I think is true, there's also quite an iconoclastic element to what Lacan is doing in as much as he's saying how you have diluted and turned the Oedipus complex into this kind of sexual imaginary rivalry between a triad of a family. That's not encapsula encapsulating, encapsulating exactly what's most important here. For him, it would appear that the Oedipus complex is something that involves a symbolic operation. It's not just about rivalry between little Danny and Daddy or whatever. There's more to it than that. So he thinks it's been reduced and, and, and made into something it's not. Secondly, when he's referring to the Oedipal myth, he does use that word myth. Now, myth has an interesting and important connotation within the domain of Lacanian psychoanalysis. One of those connotations is that it connotes symbolic functioning again. In other words, and this is really crucial, I think, when he starts to think about the Oedipus complex, he's going to make reference to his three registers. You could say, and we'll come to this point when we link back to foreclosure and some of the dilemmas that we explored when we thought about foreclosure, as a psychical operation, that the symbolic or certain symbolic operations, as it were, rescue us from the domain of the imaginary. In other words, we need to think about the Freudian Oedipus complex not merely as a, as a triangular uh, kind of internecine struggle of sexual rivalries, of a kind of imaginary dimension. We need to think about how there's a symbolic operation occurring within it, hence the notion of the myth. What is also important, and in fact pretty impossible to miss here, he says, what is a father? The question. And the answer is, it is the dead father. Lacan takes it up again under the heading of the name of the father. So, he stated it already. It's not just a father, it's the dead father. Something of a legacy, something of a, again, I suppose, symbolic trace or marking that outstrips the father. So, just to let's emphasize that. In many of the ideas that we'll go on to articulate here, there's this sense of an intergenerational, not quite transhistorical, but a generational historical dimension to what it is when he's speaking about the name of the father, which once again, to reiterate, is the dead father. And let's just make one further point there. We all know this famous thing, refrain, maybe it's Shakespearean, where it comes from, I don't know. The king is dead. Long live the king. You could say in... Freudian terms, the father is dead, long live the father. The father's legacy, the, the imprint, the symbolic legacy, the laws, the institutionalized values that came from the father, the father as a symbolic entity, are made all the stronger when the father as a physical, bodily, corporeal being is in fact dead. 
Last point about that, and we'll make one other Lacan reference before starting to move on. When he speaks about the name of the Father, in the 1950s it starts to become hyph hyphenated. So we have the name of the Father. And if I was trying to be a slightly comedic today, I would say that what we're talking about is the name of the Father, not the name of the Father. We tend to, I think, often function and focus on the Father. And again and again and again in reviewing uh, papers, uh, uh, scholarly work, I've seen how people try to apply the name of the Father, making a, almost an automatic reference to the actual being of the Father or the actual literal name of the Father. Now, of course, the name of the Father can operate, but let's stress those things. We're talking about a symbolic operation rather than recourse to the actual memory of one's own flesh and blood father, for example. And furthermore, we're talking about a naming function, a naming function, a symbolic function. The name here as a way of being located, as a way of having a symbolic identity conferred as being a viable social subject that's located within a kinship structure, within a set of rules, within a set of prohibitions, within a social symbolic location. That's what it's about. The father, in some respects, particularly if we're talking about the actual physical dude, is, is one element in that, but is certainly not the focal point in what we're talking about. What we're going to do then, very briefly, is just to make three or four more points about, I think, some characteristic errors and complications that come up when we start to think about the name of the Father. Once we've done that, we'll have a little bit of a conclusion, and then in our follow-up lecture, we'll start to link back to foreclosure and ask what exactly is enabled when the name of the Father is installed or is functioning. Okay, so <clears throat> the first thing to say, when we start talking about the name of the Father, and to link back to our foregoing lectures, remember, we did a whole sequence of lectures on foreclosure, and I asked, what is foreclosed? We said maybe, at some level, for uh, Lacan experimenting with these ideas, he thinks it's castration. Freud seems to also make this implication, but then we get to this idea that it's something more complex, something more uh, symbolically effective, it's the name of the Father. Then the next question is, well, what is the name of the Father? The answer comes back, it's a signifier. It's a privileged signifier. It's the signifier that does that anchoring of the subject in the symbolic. Now, that I think is crucial. And just before we move on, let's just make that qualification. If we're talking about how the subject gets anchored in the symbolic, remember, when a ship is anchored and it's at sea, it, it has some movement. It can move. It's not anchored. It's not concretely stationary or static that wouldn't work anchoring allows for some movement so let's just keep that in mind but then let's just quickly answer three questions that might come up signifier the signifier of the name of the father okay now technically we need to keep that in mind and i'll try and explain why but sometimes i think particularly as one takes one's first few steps into this theory it's sometimes at least for me helps not so much to prioritize the signifier of the name of the Father, because then I'm starting to think about structural linguistics and signifier and signified and all of these kinds of things, but to think about it as a kind of operation, as a kind of symbolic operation that does an anchoring. A symbolic operation that does an anchoring. It's something that is happening, or well, that has happened, and that is no longer static. So think about it in those terms. The name of the Father is a symbolic operation, and I think it helps to do that for three reasons. Number one, once we start saying name of the Father is a signifier, which it is technically, the tendency is then to say, oh, well, what is that signifier? Let's identify the signifier so we know that for Derek, the name of the Father for him was lawnmower or whatever. That's a startling thought. I'm hoping it wasn't lawnmower. Maybe filming in a garage has got some reason to do with that, but whatever. So the point, I think, is not so much to immediately start looking through case details and, and being able to pinpoint and identify, well, that's what operates as the name of the father for that person. All in good time, yeah, that's a question worth asking. But that's a kind of imaginary tendency, an imaginary impulse. Oh, let's find it. Let's locate it. Let's be able to pinpoint it. We have meaning. We have understanding. So the point of the name of the father or thinking the name of the father is a signifier is not immediately to be able to identify the signifier. Secondly, one of the problems if we think about the name of the Father as a signifier is that we sometimes start to think about it as noun, as a one single definitive thing. 
And I think that's problematic, not only because it, to, to be able to find the one single thing implies something static. Remember, my example of a ship being anchored can have movement rather than being concretely, statically fixed. So I think it can be a problem to think about it just as the name and, and then our attention is moved away from the movement of that symbolic operation. But there's also a further problem in trying to singularly, definitively define what the name of the father would have been in this case for this person. One good reason for calling something a signifier is because if something's a signifier, it always signifies to something else. It's always, remember, in structural linguistics, the operation of the signifier is not that it refers to any reference in a kind of definitive, natural, eternal, truthful, bonded way, but that it refers to other signifiers. Hence also my reference to some kind of movement. So what's important here then is that the signifier, in as much as it refers to other signifiers, has a kind of non-definitive deferral property. We never know for sure that brings with it a certain kind of movement. And it also then suggests that we be aware of trying to reduce the name of the father to one signified, that is one meaning, one kind of static representation or one kind of imaginary encapsulation of what it may be. I think we need to try and keep it open like that. Let's end then having tried to make the qualification about some of the issues that come from trying to pinpoint a signifier or think about the signifier only in a kind of uh, fully conflate signifier and signified, you could say, but as trying to locate it in a, in a kind of definitive range of meanings, because it keeps on moving, keeps on questioning, is one brief anecdote. And the anecdote might help answer this question. Why is Lacan full of all this language of the signifier? Many people find it a little bit off-putting uh, just because you know you get all entangled in all these key conceptual linguistic distinctions. But here, just let's cut to the chase. One very good reason that Lacan will often refer to signifiers is that with signifiers, dad, dad, daddy-o, kite, whatever, one is referring to other signifiers, but you could say that the meaning is never completely clear. There is a movement. I've already made this point. It means that we keep on thinking that there is some kind of progressive and attempt to try and understand, to grapple with things. And here's my little anecdote. Supervision is happening with a Lacanian supervisor, and I relate some details of a case study, and the clinician says, ask them about the grandparents. I said, like, yeah, I've done that. They know nothing about them. It's a waste of time. Every time I asked them, they said, no, I didn't know them. And my Lacanian supervisor said, excellent, ask them even more. In other words, what's important is sometimes when you don't know what the signified, the meaning seemingly definitively is, the signifier is open. It means that there's more questions, more thoughts, more hypotheses, more unconscious uh, questionings happening. In other words, the question is facilitated. It opens things up. And I suppose what I'm trying to say with that is that's another reason to think about the importance of the name of the father as not being fixed, as opening up to further questions, as being something one can never fully know. And here, in some respects, I think is our concluding point with this first mini lecture. The name of the father is something that's installed. It it's enables an anchoring, but we never fully know exactly what it is. And it's installed in an unconscious capacity. So the subject themselves never knows fully what it is. The name of the father is known, not by trying to pinpoint it accurately and finding what it might be, but by the fact that something is functioning, that some kind of uh, location, anchoring, social identification, some kind of installation of social customs, values and norms, that the big other is functioning in a viable way. That's how we know it and that's its operation.